There we go. All right. Well, today I'm going to be talking to you about keeping the way of Christ in recognizing the ways of the Antichrist. And we just have come through a teaching on Tuesday nights having to do with the Maccabees, with the Maccabean revolt. And one of the primary issues that you see there is this concept of the Antichrist. And we tend to look at this and to think about it in terms specifically having to do with the Antichrist. But the reality is that the ways of the Antichrist are among us and have been among us for many, many years. In fact, all the way back to the time of Yeshua and, and before. So we're going to look at those things. It's important to know what it is we are called to do so that we can understand when that which is contrary to what God has called us to do is, is being placed before us. So we're going to look at both sides of that coin, so to speak. Alrighty, so the natural question would be, well, what exactly are the ways of Christ? And it's really important to, to recognize that the way of Christ does not equal the way of the cross. Uh, we have many people who tend to, to think that these are interchangeable, but the way of the cross is actually specific to the stations of the cross, right? And this is the uh, 14 stations uh, that are the 14 different things that occur to Christ on, to, on his way to the cross. Um, it's a part of the Catholic traditions. Uh, it's not a bad thing, per se, um, but it's not the ways of Christ, right? We're really talking about, when we're talking about the ways of Christ, we're really talking about what it is that God has called us to do and how it is that we are to walk and to be so that we can reflect Christ correctly to the world around us. And what does that look like? Well, my favorite place to go for these sorts of things, and you can find this across the Gospels and across the Epistles, but today we're going to look specifically at the Gospel of, according to John and his Epistles uh, that he writes as well. Um, because there we have this contrast between the ways of Christ and also the way of the Antichrist. So, I would point you to John chapter 14, verse 6, and remind you that we talked about this earlier in the fall, that Yeshua says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father except through me. Okay, Remember that, that what they had was the Tanakh. Right? This is the understanding that, that they were all coming from. And it didn't get done away with, as many people would think. It's important to recognize that Christ was exclusively saying that I am the only way, the only truth, the only plurality of life. Right? There is no other way. And it's not like we can manifest some other way to, to do these things. What, the, what the, the disciples would have heard him say as well is, I am the living Torah, I am the living Torah, I am the living Torah. Each of these terms, the way, the truth, the life, were specifically used within Torah and across the Tanakh to specifically talk about the concept of living Torah. Living Torah is that which is extant, like God is extant, across and outside of time. It is Yeshua HaMashiach himself. Remember, the Gospel of John begins with, in the beginning was the Word. Right? This is what they would have understood him to say, and we lose that today, but it's, it's an exceedingly important part of the puzzle as to what it is that Christ has called us to do. It also is important because if he is the living Torah and he is calling us to walk in his way to be like the living Torah, which part of himself, which part of the living Torah did he invalidate? Did he reject? The answer to that is a big goose egg. Right? He is the living Torah. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, just as God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So they would have understood him as saying that, that he is the living Torah. Right? And we understand that as messianics. We understand that concept. All right. One of the things that, that 
I think, contrasts with what it is that, that God has called us to versus what Christianity has become is this concept of what you see in this picture. And you notice that we've got this wonderful road. It leads right up to the cross. And the suggestion here is that the cross is the finish line. Nothing could be further from the truth. The cross, the death and the resurrection of Yeshua HaMashiach, are actually the starting place for you and for I. And it is not the finishing point. And if it is, then anything that occurs after that is done, right? But it's not. It's the beginning place uh, with which we start. So what we start into is this process that is spoken of, of salvation. And that absolutely has to do with the death and resurrection of Christ, the unilateral promises of God. These are the truth of the cross, the truth of the resurrection. These are where we find the unilateral promises of God having to, to do with Exodus chapter 6, that God says that in and of himself he is going to do these things and he's going to redeem Israel, right? It's a picture of the redemption of you and I from dead in our sins. It's a picture of the rebirth by water that we have. After we cross the Red Sea, after the resurrection, after we have our rebirth from above by water, we are now in the sanctification process. The statements in Scripture are, if in Shmaing you will Shma, and I'm paraphrasing that, but that's, it's a doublet of Shma, which raises it to the idea of, perspe- uh, of perfection. If we will Shma unto the voice of Adonai our God and do what it is that he has asked us to do and keep his Brit, his covenant, then he will make of us a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And the sanctification process is dynamic, right? And it depends on God, but it depends on you and I. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a shma shma. It would have just been, this is what I'm doing. And what we see is that upon the, the completion We look forward to that time that Christ comes back. And when he comes back, we have yet another set of unilateral promises. Our glorification does not depend upon us. There's not something that we have to do to earn it. There's not something that we have to do to make it happen. God in and of himself says that he will glorify us. And that promise and the proof of that is the resurrection as well. Okay, so this contrast concept of the truth, the life, and the way are found even within the New Testament within these concepts of our salvation as a past event, as a present event, and as a future event. All three of these are represented here. So Yeshua, the living Torah, you have to remember that Yeshua is God. They are Echad. There is no light that passes between them. There is no difference between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right? What God has spoken will come to pass. And there's not one that's going to change the other. Right? Because they are aspects of one monogenous being, or I'm sorry, not being, but, but God. So John chapter 14 uh, says... And and what we get here, and in these scriptures that follow, really is what it is that Christ requires of us in this sanctification process. The question is, what is it that we are supposed to be doing? Well, thankfully, he's very clear about that. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now this is the first of a number of different statements, a number of different ways that God, uh, through, uh, that, that God has spoken to us to tell us that if we keep the commandments, if we are in that sanctification process and smiling onto the word of God, that he will do certain things. These are if-then statements, right? And the idea that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit will come and make their home with us and in us, who will abide in us, will tabernacle with us and in us, is, is just amazing. 
right? And it is dependent upon us shmawing onto the voice of Adonai our God and keeping the commandments. Verse 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Think about that. He who cannot have sin, cannot see sin, will be in us and with us. That's not a promise for today. That's a promise for the glorification when we are completely remade uh, in the image of God. And it says in, in the Old Testament that God will cause us to walk in his ways. Not that we will choose to do that, but God will cause us to walk in his ways. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me, does not keep my words. And the words that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Again, they are a cod. There's not a different set of words that God the Father speaks that God the Son does not also speak. They are a cod. They are one and the same. Yeshua is that living Torah. He is that living word that became flesh. And it does not change. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, Yeshua goes into this analogy of of the vine. And we we often, at least most of the, the commentaries that I have heard and read, kind of separate this out as though all of a sudden he's talking about something different. He is still a talking, talking about abiding in the word of God, abiding in living Torah, keeping the commandments of God. That's the point of, of what he's speaking to here. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, remember, think back. If you love me and keep my commandments, I will come and abide with you. God the Father will come and abide with you. He's talking about the same thing. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Okay, often 
And if you do a web search, you will find in a web search on the commandments of Jesus, you will often find that, that people will say, oh, there's two. Well, and if you keep looking, you'll see there's 25. You'll see other set websites that say there's 52. There's some that say there's 214. I would just point you back to the fact that Yeshua is the living Torah. There is no difference between God the Father and God the Son. He did not come to replace what it is that is himself, the living Torah, but to make it replete for us, to open it up and open our eyes so that we would understand it more fully, so that we could do what it is that he asks of us. Right? This is what the sanctification process is about. We are to shma shma unto the voice of Adonai our God, and to judge rightly, because some of these things seem to conflict with each other. Okay, well, it says don't carry on the Sabbath. But when the Lord of the Sabbath, when Yeshua himself looks at you, straightens your legs out that have been horribly crippled for all your life, and says, pick up your mat and walk, it is right, it is just, it glorifies God to do so. Right? That wasn't a sin, even though it was the first of the sins that they understood not to carry on the Sabbath. This is where the heart of what it is that God is asking us to do is not just to know of his law, but to rightly discern it so that we can walk in it. Because that the law is righteousness, and we are called to walk in righteousness. And again, it is Torah. Moving to 1 John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 4, um, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard, we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Think back to the beginning of John. Right? That is one of the ways that God, uh, that, that, uh, that it's revealed to us that Yeshua is the light. Right? And the light came into the world and, and shone among the men, but the men didn't, didn't want to be in it right? because our deeds were evil. Think of John 3.16 and keep reading and you see just exactly that. Um, but if we walk in the light, I'm sorry, if, if we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Well, commonly, people say, oh, well, you know, at the cross, Yeshua did away with all the sin. But in actuality, we still have, during this time frame, until Christ comes back, we still have our human nature. We have the Holy Spirit to help conform us more and more towards the image of, of God. But there's not one of us who doesn't sin. We may get by with, with not actually taking the knife and driving it into somebody's back, but we get angry with people, right? Matthew tells us that, that the level at which the bar is set is not the easy bar. Well, I may get angry with them, but I didn't do anything about it. It's whether or not we got angry in our hearts to begin with. If we have become angry with our brother, we have already murdered him in our hearts. Right? So the bar is someplace where not one of us is going to be able to cross it. 
And just as we see in the Old Testament that after the law is given, with the law is a way to get a reset, right? The sin offering, the guilt offering, the trespass offerings. A way to, to have an approach back onto God when we mess it up, right? We still are being called to that within the New Testament. To, to examine ourselves and to see where we fall short of what it is that we should be doing in our walk with Christ and then to repent of those things, to turn from them. And if we stumble, if we stumble seven times, get up seven times, right? It's a continual process until Christ comes back. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the only atonement for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Boy, he just tied it right back into keeping the commandments of God. Right? Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Right? One of the concepts that we have here, upon us, through Abraham, was laid this requirement that we should become tamim. Not be perfect, but that we should become perfect. Chapter 17 of Genesis says, uh, walk before my face and become you tamim, become you flawless. Right? It would tie it into how all of the, the sacrifices were brought. But this concept of being perfected is one that, that started with Abraham, laid upon him, and anybody who is a child of Abraham by faith carries that same obligation to become flawless. Right? Not to be flawless, not to be perfect, but to be in the process of striving, in the process to become sanctified. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same ways in which he walked. Boy, that just makes it that much tougher. Right? We have the commandments. We have what it is that he has called us to do. But not only that, but we have to judge rightly as he judged as to how we are to be doing things. And thankfully, he didn't just cut us loose, but he had God the Father send us the Holy Spirit so that we would have that remembrance and have that companion to help us and to guide us. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for, our, for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Now we talked about this this morning in conjunction with Leviticus chapter 25, having to do with the concept of the seven yearly cycles which culminate in the Jubilee, culminate in the return of property back onto the people that God had tenancied to them, right? The Israelites didn't possess the land as in ownership. They were tenants. And God says specifically that the land is his, right? And likewise, the slaves were set free in that time frame as well. But within that is an interesting passage within the scripture that doesn't talk just about the Shabbat cycle or about the Jubilee cycle, but it basically says, oh, by the way, if you see your brother in need, if it's clothing, if it's food, if it's whatever, you're supposed to supply these things if you have the ability, right? Not just within the Jubilee year, but across all of the years. Little children, let us not love in, in word, or talk, but in deed and in truth. Let me see if I got that right. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and, and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, 
If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Right? That's the concept that, that if we are walking in the ways of Adonai, if we are walking in the ways of Christ, and that Holy Spirit is with us, and we're plugging into that, plugging into Scripture, and if our heart is not pricking us that we have an issue, then that would suggest that we are following what it is that Christ has called us to do. The conscience becomes important because the conscience is the connection to the Holy Spirit. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God, and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So again, this, this concept of the sanctification, this concept of the walk that we should be in, the way of Adonai, we should be on that ascent approach unto God. Right? He has these core bonds, he has these approaches, like the approach unto a harbor, the approach to an airport, the approach unto a mountaintop. If you get off the approach... He's also made a way of return to put you back onto the path because our God is a great and merciful God and his chesed, his loving kindness, mercy, and grace extends even to those of us who stumble a lot. Right? He is a great and merciful God. What he wants from us is to shma shma unto the voice of Adonai, our God. And to do what is upright in his eyes. To correctly discern. Okay, if you want to bring them down to 613 commandments. Okay, how do you correctly discern which of those is to take priority? Well, if you're judging with uprightness of his heart and his eyes, you will do that correctly. He wants us to give ear to his instruction. This is the concept in the Hebrew of, of really delving in and understanding deeply his Torah and the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah. He wants us to zealously keep his statutes. And then he also wants us to zealously keep his Brit, his covenant, the covenant that he has made with us, the covenant that is the present that he has given to us by which we will be saved by the blood of the Lamb. Because the covenant represents God. It represents Yeshua. And it represents his commitment to us to make a way possible for us where there is no way possible for you and I to make it happen. Okay, well, that's what it entails for keeping the way of Christ. Right? And again, you can't do this apart from Scripture. You have to be in Scripture in order to hear the Word of God, to have that Word to work on you, and to have that Holy Spirit working with you to conform you. Right? If you are walking apart from Scripture, and that's not part and parcel of what you do on a daily basis, then those touch points that God has to help you to walk in the ways of His Son become less and less frequent. Okay, And so the being in the scripture is just vitally important. Because you cannot keep what you do not know about. If you're not in the scripture, you will not know the word of God. You will not know the commandments. How are you going to keep something that you don't know about? Right? You have to be listening intently to what he has written. And he has given it to us. And we have it. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about recognizing the ways of the Antichrist. Well, one of the, the primary ways that the Antichrist works is to seduce God's elect away from the truth, to seduce God, God's people away from the living Torah and following after that which God has called us to do. So when we look at that, he may present us with a different gospel, right? Well, the, we've seen a lot of different ways that are all wrong that one can make oneself righteous to stand before God. 
Halakha would say you just need to use what God has given you as a recipe book and you will make yourself righteous enough to stand before a holy God. I'm sorry, but it does not work that way. You have the concept of hyper-Calvinism where God is this great, wonderful God who literally has wound up the clocks. He's put all the gears in place. Everything is completely set as to what you're going to do. And by the way, where's an opportunity within that to shema unto the voice of Adonai your God and to give a considered response to either say, yes, Lord, I will. Don't understand it, but here I am. Or to say, no, Lord, I will not. It's Shema. It's that concept of listening intently to God's word, to giving a consideration to what it is he's asking of you, and then to say, okay, my considered response is this. Right? There is no word in biblical Hebrew for obey, which is an exceedingly important part. But hyper-Calvinism it's like a clock that's been wound up and he turned it loose and walked away from it. Not true. Arminianism, very popular today. The concept of, of really polysoterological. Boy, that's a mouthful. Poly means many and soterological means salvation. We have people, we have songs that we sing and I like some of the songs. But when we start singing the, the Lord, give me the right words, give me the right arguments so that I can convince somebody and get them to elect Christ, we have just now said innately that there are as many ways to Christ as there are different people because there's different words that work for different people. There is one gospel and one gospel alone. And it is God himself that does the work to change the heart. And... That's good news, because otherwise, if I'm trying to give the gospel and I give the wrong words, am I not responsible for my brother not coming to Christ? Ooh, that's a tough side of that concept of Arminianism. We have Pelagianism. Well, Pelagius basically said, you know what, Christ is a good example. We can use his instructions, very much like Halakha does, to just walk the ways in which he walked, and really his death meant nothing. Right, we have Charles Finney, very much revered amongst many of, the, of Christianity today. And yet he denied that Christ could either die for anybody or that his death could make any difference. He was very clear in, in his systematic theology that he wrote. Did not feel that that was possible. That's a rejection of the gospel. He saw what Christ did is providing for really good instructions that you could follow and by which make yourself righteous. We have different Christs, right? Well, you know what? He wasn't really a man. Okay, wrong. He wasn't really God. Wrong. He wasn't the Messiah. Wrong. Well, he never really existed. Wrong. These are all ways in which the truth of Yeshua is attempted to be negated. Right? And many of these are the heresies that we have, have dealt with. Uh, the never existed one is one that, that's more recent. But all the other ones were, were there at the time of the early church fathers. We have this concept of, of a different God. Well, maybe it's that Gnostic mystic, mysticism thing. You know, New Ageism, which is rearing its head again. Hinduism, polytheistic. Maybe it's the anti-Yahweh, anti-Christ God of Islam. Right? Really easy to show that Allah is not and could not be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as they claim. One of the titles for Allah is the greatest of deceivers. You cannot simultaneously be the God of truth and the God that is the greatest of all deceivers and be the same God. Sorry to those that are of the Islam faith, but you're following something that is wrong. And, and of course, Muhammad functions much as an antichrist when you look at, at what occurs with him. You have this concept of universalism, 
where basically anything goes. You're okay, I'm okay, we're gonna take from the, the Wiccans, we're gonna take from the Hindus, we're gonna take from the Native Indians. We're gonna synergize this all together into a new reality that tells us about this God that really is a God of everything. Well, I'm sorry, but that's also wrong. And you have, particularly today, this concept of a, of a different truth, right? And we see this embedded in the concept of evolution, which says specifically that everything that was ever created came out of nothing. Well, the this, this statement is true and correct. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Because that is the way things work. There's this idea that, that, that we can decouple science from God. Right? The earliest scientists were men of God. And what they were trying to do was understand the creation around them. And to, to model it so that they could use that to do things. Well, the model is never as good as the actuality. Who wants the picture of the Big Mac when you can have the Big Mac? No cheese, please. And then we have atheism. This idea that, that no God exists, but it's only man. So there are lots of ways that, that the spirit of the Antichrist seeks to divide us, to separate us out. And notice that many of these have been at work in the church. Even this concept of different gods. We have the Pope saying, yeah, we can, we can be in fellowship with Islam. It really, it's the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm sorry, but it absolutely positively is not. Now remember, as quick as we are to draw a distinction between those that are of God and those that are not of God, you better also in the same breath never forget that there's not a single one of those people that are not of God that don't have just as much of the image of God in them as we do in us. They just stand apart from God. And we cannot hate them. We cannot belittle them. Our desire should be to preach the gospel to them that, that they would also come to that place to where they are of the body of Christ. But they have as much God in them as we do in us. And we cannot forget that because that's another way that the, that the adversary will instill in us the hatred of our brother. Even if our brother doesn't walk with Christ. We have the culture of the world. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17 to 17 says... Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life. Does that sound familiar? Right? Those are the origins, the way in which the adversary steps us off of the approach unto God unto some other place. And anything that is walking off the approach is taking you away from God. These are not of the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, there's lots of different ways that we could, could look at this, but I would like you to also think about the culture of the world from the standpoint of we've come to a place where we have a, have a, a culture of the world that does not have consequences. Right? Well, I can have sex outside of marriage, and if somebody gets, gets pregnant, we can take care of that. No consequences there. Right? Abortion. We can have euthanasia. There's all kinds of ways that that works out. Specifically, and, and they all kind of bleed together, but I would point out that within the realm that most people today that are not of Christ exist, and many that are of Christ, we have music, cinema, TV, and games, all of which lead someplace other than towards God. Now, as we understand the neuroscience of this, and the neuroscience of transmitters and rhythms and rates, 
these things become more understandable. You can have something that's occurring at a certain frequency and occur at a specific rate, and that triggers within the brain releases of certain neurotransmitters. We know that images will do that. And think about the images and the things that are placed before us in just regular TV. Not to mention Netflix and HBO and other places that you can, you can get even deeper into areas which are bad. But the violence triggers neurotransmitters. It triggers epinephrine. The sexual activity and promiscuousness triggers those same things. You have sexually deviant, be, deviant behavior. Now we're stepping outside of the realm of, of just sex outside of marriage, but sex with people of the same sex, sex with animals, sex by oneself. We have the concepts of, of asexual identification. Well, we can redefine who it is that we are. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of, of the woman who wrote uh, the Harry Potter series, but she's in the news currently because, and, and originally the people who proffered the argument between gender and sex being different, that sex is what you were physically born with, a scientific XY chromosome sort of thing, and gender being this fluid sort of thing that you can make into whatever you want to with our abilities to modify the world today. She basically said, no, sex is, is what it is. And the gender fluid community has turned on her in ways that, that in, in Twitter and in other places that are, that are just terrible. Again, I, I don't support the other things that she does. Remember that, that her reason for writing the Harry Potter ser series was to increase the knowledge of magic and to increase the, the knowledge of, of an alternative to God. Those are her words. And yet many of our children read these books. And we think, oh, it's just a great story. You know, it was a great story with a, a hidden purpose. Well, actually she wasn't hidden about it. I mean, she was very open about why she wrote the books. Right? She wants, she's an atheist. She wants people to have an alternative that they can latch on to. That, that fills that need for what she sees as this magic kingdom stuff of, of God. Um, drugs. Drugs we know mess with neurotransmitters. Uh, love of mammon and power. Uh, atheistic science versus the crackpots of Christ. Right? When's the last time that you saw in the regular cinema or TV a Christian that was depicted as somebody other than a crackpot, somebody other than controlling. Now, thankfully, we do have some media that are Christian-specific, and obviously they don't depict it that way, but they are few, and the vast majority of them are all geared towards providing a culture of the world which will literally make it harder for one to step into that role. But worse than that, you have all these neurotransmitters that are occurring with all these things. When you consider how much it is that we have in the form of, of iPhones, and, and I'll come back to that thought. So when we look at Torahlessness, which is the other way that the Antichrist works to get us to where we are not doing what God has called us to do. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep Torah. Don't be lawless. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22 says, Children, it is the last hour, as you know, uh, as, as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Even in the days right after Christ, in the time of John, he was dealing with the fact that people were stepping forward and saying, well, you know, he's not God. He wasn't the man. He didn't really exist. I mean, there's all kinds of things that they were fighting that were heresies at the time. Um, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, think of wheats and tares, 
uh, that it might have been plain, um, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness, Torah, has been born of him. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let not one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever practices, makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason... The Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, this is within that same epistle in which he was, was telling people, look, if you're having problem with sin, repent, and you will, we have an advocate in the Father. Notice that it's not just the fact that there's sin, but it's this concept of making a practice of sinning. If this is the way that one is, that is the way of Antichrist. Right? We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And as this epistle tells us, we each struggle with sin. We stumble, we get up, we repent, and we continue back upon the path of the ascent onto and the approach unto God. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Right? He's combining the two of these. Think back on the words of Christ. He, he asks, um, he's asked what's the greatest commandment, and he returns the question back onto the, the, to the scribe who had asked it and says, well, how do you see it? And he basically goes through the Via Hafta and the Via Hafta Lareca, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength and all your soul. I think he adds in mind in there too. He had four instead of three. And he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Christ says, you have spoken correctly. The kingdom of God is not far from you. To which, after making such a great response, he says, yeah, but who's my brother? Well, I can figure out a way to divvy that out so that I can narrow down who my brother is to a place where, you know what, basically I just got to take care of myself. Not the way it's supposed to be. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Remember that all the law and the prophets, Yeshua says, can be summed down to that one thing. Love your neighbor as yourself that loves God because the image of God is in each and every one of them like it is in each and every one of us. And if we love God, we're loving the image of God that is in them, even when they do things that are unlovable. We should not be like Cain who was 
the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Who? That's tough. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If you love me, keep my commandments. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit will come and abide in you and with you. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to distill it down to one place, that's where it goes. We also have this this concept of idolatry that is another way in which the adversary instills the spirit of Antichrist into the world. And this ties very much up into the culture of the world. You know, we, we think of amusement, and we think of places like Disneyland and things like that. Really happy thing, right? The word muse means to carefully think and consider about things. Shema, shema, unto the voice of Adonai, your God, asks you to muse on his commandments and to rightly discern them. Amusement is without thinking. It's not what we have come to redefine it as. Consider. Most of us, including myself, have iPhones or Androids, right? There are all these apps on there, and they lead us away from thinking, and they provide another outlet for our time. They are, in that aspect, an idol. And I may not struggle as much as other people with it, But I can tell you, I spend a fair amount of time checking the news. I don't play games. But it still takes my time. The average person in America pulls their phone out something like 40 or 50 times a day. Right? How many of us pull out our Bibles 40 to 50 times a day? Where are we focusing our attention? Where are we focusing our adulation, where are we focusing our time? Well, if I'm doing this, I can't be looking to see where my brothers and sisters may have a need that I can meet. And I certainly don't have attention focused elsewhere. Right? This is hard. It's hard for me to, to stand up here and say this because I know how important that phone is in my life. And I love the Word of God, yet it still draws me and pulls me in places and in ways that it shouldn't. Right? So, I won't point the finger at any of you, but I'll just tell you that for me, the phone is an issue. How many other idols do we have in this world? How many other ways do we have of turning off our brains with the television, with movies, with games, with chat rooms, with pornography, right? And it's really easy to say, well, you know what? I don't do the whole pornography thing. But you look at the amount of time and energy that's spent downloading movies. You look at the amount that people spend on cable, on satellite, on Netflix, on all of these other ways in which we can now be amused, we can now be switched from thoughtful to not thinking. And this is tough, right? And this is only one of the ways in which we take the things of the world and make idols. Right? There are other ways. But this is a tough one. Right? It speaks to us in how connected we are within the ways of the world, though we would all choose not to be. 
right? There's nobody that's here in this house today that says, yep, what I really want to do is, is seek after the ways of the Antichrist, right? Not a single one of us. We all love the Lord. We all seek after him. And yet the ways of the world are always picking and, and digging into us to try to bring us to a place to where we aren't thinking. And we've taken our attention off of him who gives us life onto other things. And that's tough. It is really hard. But that is the ways of the, of the Antichrist. I, I don't have a good solution for that. I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how in this day and age where landlines for most of us don't exist anymore and that ability to reach out and to text our neighbors, to text our family members, to reach out and call somebody no matter whether they're hiking, whether they're at Disneyland, whether they're in the bathroom. <laughs> we have that ability and we depend upon it. My work contacts me via text to let me know that they, they need help. How do, how do we get right away from that? I don't have a good answer to that. I'll raise the flag and everybody can throw stones at me for that, and rightly so, because it, it's not a good, comfortable place to be when we realize that there are things in our life that take a greater amount of our time, a greater amount of our resources, a greater amount of our attention than him who gave us life. Him who promises us life everlasting. Again, I don't know what the answer to that is. I think that's something that in, in prayer and consideration we all need to look at. And to figure out how it is that we can make that less of an impact. Right? The good news is that we're all here. Right? Including those that are joining us online. That means we have a heart for the Lord. Right? And we're not in the group that practices sin, but we are in the group that has sin. And how we deal with that is now up to us, to our conscience, to the Holy Spirit as it pricks us and pricks our consciences to get us to walk in a way that truly is a way of Christ. Amen? I think, you know, particularly as we were going through those sets of songs, the thing that really struck me, and I, you know, I can't speak for any of you, but I, I can just tell you that, that going through that sermon, you know, there's a real danger of just feeling the weight of the sin that the world is trying to put upon us. Yeah. To feel the weight of and the hopelessness that, that comes from having the things of the world be so invasive into our lives and so much a part of where we are that it would be easy to lose sight of the hope that we have in Him. If it depends upon me to figure out a way to, to make, you name your, your way in which the world is trying to corrupt us, but let's just stick with the phone. If, if it depends upon me to make that into something that is not going to be pulling me away from God, if it's me, I'm done. But we have one who's paid the price. By his stripes we were healed. Right? We know the Lord and Savior. Right? What we do need to do is to be responsive to listen to that Holy Spirit and to let it to speak to us, to guide us. You know, praise God that it's not my path that I have to walk to get me out of the mire. But it's the path that He provides. It's the path that He gives to each and every one of us to take us from where we are in our sin to bring us 
panim el panim, face to face with the Lord God Almighty. He is trustworthy. He is righteous. He is faithful to do that which He has spoken into existence. His desire for each of us is to be on that path and to have us stand before the throne and to look upon us and to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We just need to shema. Be in our word. And then be responsive to do that which he has asked. Especially in this time frame where we are celebrating Hanukkah and we're celebrating Christmas. We're getting together with family members, some of which know the Lord, some of which do not. Christmas has become a very secular experience for many people. 7% of Jewish custom, uh, Jewish people celebrate Christmas because it's, they view it as a thing of the world. Right? We need to keep our focus on God and we need to keep our, our focus on the things of God and we need to be ready to give an explanation for the hope that we have within us. To shine that light into our families. And if that opportunity comes across a table or under a tree or standing beside a menorah, wherever those opportunities come, we should take it to bring the light of the Lord into this world. The elders are going to be up here after service for prayer needs that you have. Remember, that's one of the most important duties that we have is to pray for you and with you. If you need prayer, do not leave the house of the Lord today without seeking it. And we hope that all of you have a fantastic week. And I think we need to do the shofar and then the, we'll do the Aharonic blessing. If you please stand for the sounding of the shofar. God, how we look forward to hearing that at the return of our Lord and Savior. Amen. When the children of the Lord were gathered together, God instructed Moses to have Aaron speak this blessing upon the children of God, that the name of the Lord would be upon them. Ya er Adonai Panavaleka Ikuneka Yisa Adonai Panavaleka Via Simleka Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace, the peace of the Shar Shalom. Do not leave this house. If you need prayer, please come up so that we can pray with you and for you. And remember, as this week progresses, step into the world to be that light unto your neighbors, unto your children, unto your family members, that all the ways that we would walk in this world would shine the light of Yeshua to all those around us, that they would look upon us and say, surely here is a child of the Most High God. Blessings to you all. Amen.